Well, hello, and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOFT webinar. This webcast is part of an ACM SIGSOFT commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOFT webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Betty Zakheim, Vice President of Tasktop Technologies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. I have a few housekeeping items, however. Um, some of them are shown on the slide in front of you. So first, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. If you can, close and relaunch the presentation. To, to control your volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Gail speaks, and she'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You'll, be, you'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. So today's presentation is Improving Software Development Productivity Minute by Minute by Dr. Gail Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a professor of computer science and an, and, excuse me, and an associate dean of science at the University of British Columbia. Her research interests are improving the productivity of software developers and knowledge workers by giving them the tools to identify, manage, and coordinate the information that really matters for their work. Her work her work as uh, Mick Kirsten's PhD advisor led them both to found TaskTop Technologies. Now, TaskTop's mission is to connect the practitioners in the software development lifecycle by integrating the tools they use every day. This integration allows team members to reduce the amount of time they spend finding and sharing information and spend more time engaged in the craft of software development. So in addition to her duties at the University of British Columbia, Gail is TaskTop's co-founder and chief scientist. So without further ado, Gail, take it away. Thanks, Betty, and thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, talking about productivity in January seems to be a really good time because the start of the new year really seems to bring a multitude of articles and news about productivity as many of us think about how to improve our daily lives and how you know, organizations and governments think about how to improve our economies and how they work. So the Six Off webinar series actually started off, I think it was about a week ago, a week and a half, with a webinar on measuring software productivity by Steve McConnell. So it seems like we have a bit of a theme going on at the beginning of this webinar series for 2016. Steve gave a really nice overview of why we might want to measure software development productivity, the challenges that surround that measurement, and showed that much of what a business might want to measure could be addressed through non- or quasi-measurement approaches. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack in this talk. I want to tell you about some work I've been doing with colleagues at the University of Zurich and Microsoft Research to understand software development productivity from the bottom up. What do software developers perceive as enhancing and impeding their productivity? What do developers actually do all day? And how can we help streamline their work processes? But before we delve into the details, let's just remind ourselves about why we should care about software development productivity. It's been over 40 years since the term software crisis was coined but we're still in a state where we're unable to produce the software, world, software the world needs and demands fast enough. Mark Andreessen described the situation of software eating the world. He argues in a Wall Street Journal article that software has become vital to every industry and is in fact transforming every industry. Tremendous opportunities abound, but one of the challenges we have is to produce the software given the need and the limited supply of individuals we have. Whenever we are in a situation where we need more output with limited input, attention is always going to turn to ways to improve productivity. So maybe if we look back at history, we can have a little bit of an idea about how we might go about improving software development productivity. In the early 1900s, Frederick Taylor advocated better efficiency as a means to improve productivity. This picture is of a radio plant. If you want more radios, the answer is simple. Just hire more workers and make each worker more efficient. In this approach, management decisions were really global, and workers were treated as interchangeable. 
Each worker was considered just a cog in a much larger machine. This approach, of course, has its limitations. Workers do not generally like repetitive tasks, and they tended to work at the slowest pace that would go un unpunished. So if we fast forward a bit, Henry Ford really started to change this management attitude. He respected his workers and wanted to reduce the heavy turnover that he saw in his department. At times, it's reported that almost 300 workers were hired per year to fill 100 positions. For Ford, efficiency meant hiring and keeping the best workers. A story is told about a worker at a Ford plant who suggested a manufacturing improvement that saved the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. Henry Ford rewarded the employee and asked him when he had thought of the idea. The employee said years ago. Asked by an incredulous Ford why he didn't say anything earlier, the employee replied, well, nobody asked me. Ford began to empower workers and engage them in a search for better efficiency and productivity. This philosophy was also espoused by Edward Deming. Deming believed there was unlimited potential in workers, and it was really up to a company or an organization to remove the barriers to let people collaborate effectively. These ideas of worker empowerment have continued to evolve over the rest of the 1900s and the early 2000s. The Toyota production system at the bottom of the slide shows the and-on cords that workers on the assembly line may pull if they believe there's a problem with the quality of the product or the process. Allowing a worker to stop an assembly line is really the antithesis of the radio factory in which workers were just cogs in a machine. So interestingly, in software development, studies about software development productivity have often taken a top-down and worker as a cog type of approach. For instance, early studies in software engineering considered rather simplistic measures of output, such as lines of code, and considered how many lines of code an individual might produce in a day. In such measures, the software developers are largely being treated as interchangeable. Surprisingly, there have been few studies about how software developers perceive their own productivity. And if we think about empowering the individual, from those perspectives, we might learn how we might improve overall software development productivity. And that's the journey that I want to take you through in this talk. I want to take you through some of the studies that we've been conducting about developers. I want to start with the survey results that we have about how developers perceive their productivity. So look at productivity from a developer's perspective. In the second part of the talk, I'll compare and contrast the survey results to what we find when we actually observe developers at work. Because we know when we think back about how we work, it's not really always what's actually happening. And in the third part of the talk, I'll describe some recent work in which we have collected and analyzed activity data about what developers really do minute by minute. Based on those kinds of uh, results, I want to take you through some ideas about ways that we can help empower software developers and teams to improve their work and, as a byproduct, improve their productivity. So let's start with how developers really think about their own productivity. When do they perceive they're being productive, and when do they perceive they're not being productive? This work is joint with Andre Meyer at the University of Zurich, supervised by Thomas Fritz, also at the University of Zurich. And we've been collaborating with Tom Zimmerman at Microsoft Research. So it's really been a collaborative effort between both academia and industrial researchers. In this section, I want to describe to you the results that we have of a survey that we conducted. Our online survey had 28 questions, eight of which were focused on background and experience of the developers, 17 of which were about perceptions of their productivity, and the remaining three were really inducing them and trying to understand what results they would like to see reported back. We recruited participants for the survey using Twitter and within Microsoft. We received 379 valid responses to the survey, 185 from the Twitter, Twitter sphere, and 194 from Microsoft. 93% of the participants listed their job as a software developer. The remaining 7% reported experience in software development, but had moved on to perhaps more math type careers at present. The average participant had 9.2 years of experience. The differences between the general population and the micro partic Microsoft participants were minor when we analyzed the results, so we're just going to present them as aggregated over all 370.
Let's start with the conditions under which software developers perceive themselves as productive. We ask each participant to complete the sentence, I have a productive day when, in up to three different ways. The graphics show the top four reasons that were mentioned by the participants of the survey. Most of them, over half, responded that their workday is productive when they complete tasks, achieve their planned goals, or make progress on their goals. The second most mentioned reason is getting into a flow without many context switches and with no or few interruptions and distractions. Approximately a fifth of the participants mention that a productive day occurs when there's no meetings. This might not surprise many of us. And approximately a fifth also stated a productive day results when they have clear goals that they're attempting to achieve. Other questions on the survey really focused on developers' perceptions of product productivity in terms of the activities they perform. The green graph shows the top four activities mentioned as productive. Not surprisingly, many developers cited coding-related activities as productive. You can also see that coding appears as a category in the unproductive activity graph. Participants differentiated between productive coding activities such as implementing a new feature, and unproductive ones, often they listed as unproductive debugging and testing, which su might surprise many of you. Many other activities also had mixed responses, sometimes being described as productive and sometimes being described as unproductive. As we saw before, often participants think that meetings are unproductive. It's the largest of the bar that we had and reported as unproductive activities. Interestingly, though, 17% of the participants actually thought that meetings could be productive. Meetings were cited as productive when they included decision making, had clear focus or goals, improved relationships between developers, helped others, or when the meeting is well prepared. Unproductive meetings were cited as being ones in which goals are missed, there's no preparation, there are too many participants, or the meeting goes over time. I'm sure we've all been at many meetings that had those characteristics. Another kind of activity that had very mixed views was email. 18% considered email unproductive, whereas 10% considered email as productive. The amount of email seems to appear to contribute to when the email is unproductive. None of us like having really, really large inboxes. One participant stated, tracking and responding to tons of emails and email communications going back and forth for days when there's no closure is when I feel that email is unproductive. In addition to understanding what leads to productivity or not, we also wanted to understand from the developers how they thought productivity might be best measured. To do this, we gave the participants in our survey 23 possible measures to rate on a five-point Likert, from very desirable measure to a measure that was very undesirable. This overall graphic gives you a summary of the results, and I'll point you to the references later where you can find the uh, higher results if you're so inclined to look at them. On this graph, each of the different rows is a different possible measure that was rated. The dark green part of the bar represents strong agreement, so five on a Likert scale, in terms of a measure that would help assess productivity. And the right-hand side where it becomes orange represents strong, strong disagreement. As you can see, there's not a lot of widespread agreement on what the best measure is to measure a developer's productivity. The metric with the highest rating on the top line is the number of work items, tasks, or bugs that I close. Other highly ra ra rated measures were time spent on work items, time spent on code reviews, time spent writing code, and the total number of code reviews. The mix on person work and teamwork and on production and quality is kind of interesting. People both saw when they were contributing to other people's code through code reviews as being productive, as well as items that they were working on. At the bottom of the graph are the measures of interest of least interest to the developers. They include the number of emails written and the amount of code worked on. Not surprisingly, developers really don't like measures like lines of code. 11% of the participants in the survey explicitly stated that they would not want to be measured because they think that measuring decreases their productivity. 
They may also have privacy concerns, and they think it's not possible to accurately measure productivity by any means. So here are some takeaways that we had from conducting this survey. There's absolutely no single metric that developers agree would help or assess or measure their productivity. Participants usually rated several metrics as likely being helpful, and these metrics differed between developers, suggesting that measuring one's productivity is highly individual. When we asked the participants in an open-ended question on what they would want to measure to help meet their goals, 27% mentioned measuring activity to know how much time they spent on their computer in meetings or taking breaks. 18% were interested in measuring the actual work or the achievements they had. 17% wanted to measure the value of their work, such as the success of a feature or the value to a customer. And 16% were interested in the average time spent per task. We see in this kind of results a variety of perspectives on productivity actually provides us an opportunity as researchers. The rise of activity tracking shows that humans can be interested in, motivated by, and change their behavior when they're provided data that enables more self-monitoring and self-awareness. Think of how many Fitbits were probably given as holiday gifts this year. Although there might not be a single measure like steps walked per day to apply to software development, Many of the measures of interest to developers are possible, possible to track, opening possibilities for dashboards that summarize the activities of an individual. These dashboards might help alleviate privacy concerns, but still empower them to be able to think about and reflect on their own productivity. The results of our survey raised a lot of questions for us. As a result, we were interested in actually going in and watching what developers do at work to get an understanding of whether the survey results were really indicative of how developers work. We were interested in whether developers have a common meaning for a task or a context switch. We were interested in the interruptions that they reported occurring and impeding their, impeding their productivity. So in order to, to look at this in more depth, we decided to extract some themes from our survey results and take those forward to look at in terms of an observational study. The observational study that we conducted involved 11 professional software developers from three different international software development companies of varying size. Two of the developers in that we observed were female and the rest were male. The participants had an average of over five years of work experience. In this study, a researcher sat behind each participant, observed what they were doing, and coded their activities for hours. Not an easy task to watch a lot of information going across on developers' schemes, trying to capture what was working on. These four hours were typically observed with two hours before and two hours after lunch, although occasionally, in order to suit our participants' schedule, we ended up doing perhaps three hours before lunch. And Every time the participants switched a program on their computer, was interrupted by others, interrupted themselves, or switched a task, our observer logged what had happened. After the observations, we interviewed each participant to discuss the tasks on which work occurred, perceptions and reflections on productivity, talk about the context switches that occurred, the code check-ins, the meetings, the email, and just really have a discussion about the kind of work that was occurring. The graphic that you can see depicts the results of the first session of observation of each of the participants. So each row on this graph depicts the work of a different participant with the first letter on the y-axis, such as R1, indicating that the company is from participant R, from company R. Each bar is divided into different segments, with each segment representing a particular task. Those are the gray parts that you might be able to see on the bar. When tasks are revisited, the same grayscale is used to represent the task. So if you look at the bars closely, you can see that participants often went back to the same task. The little icons indicate the different activities that were undertaken. So a lot of the circular activities are related to development directly, such as coding, bugging, code reviews. Triangles are meetings, whether informal or planned. 
downwards triangles, our email planning tasks. So many, many different kinds of activities are actually shown. If there's a line coming out of a little icon on one of the bars, that shows the duration of an activity. Perhaps the most striking aspect of this graphic, at least to me, is always the sheer number of activities worked on by each participant and the very quick changes that occur between the activities. Particularly for participants T1 and T2 near the bottom of the graph, there is a lot going on that they've been switching between in the period that we observed. When asked about whether the work they observed was productive or not, eight of these people stated that they were fairly or very productive during these observational sessions. So let's take a look at what we learned in a little bit more detail from this graph. Picking up the first theme about tasks, we found that participants worked on between two and 10 tasks in the four hours that we observed them with a mean of just under five tasks each. These tasks included fixing a bug, reviewing code, helping coworkers with a problem, or reading and writing emails. They switched between these tasks quite frequently with a mean task switch rate of 13.3 times per hour. Task switches occurred for a variety of reasons, including helping someone else make progress, unblocking a coworker, interrupting themselves, or waiting for, for other tools to finish, like a build. By performing a task switch, participants mentioned that they could get other small tasks done and help increase their productivity. When they did work on a task, they spent an average of 6.2 minutes on the task. With frequent switching of tasks, the number of different tasks worked on is similar to that reported when other information technology workers have been observed in other research papers. We did note that the tasks we observed did not always equate to work items that might be documented and stored in an issue management system. One of the highly rated measures by developers in the survey we conducted was to track work items in terms of trying to assess their productivity. However, we found that participants worked on many more tasks than trackable work items. This difference may lead to a measure of work items underrepresenting all of the kinds of work that a developer is doing and progressing on. All of these other tasks also were creating valuable output. So if we used only work items, we might be missing a lot of the important productivity that a developer is actually performing. Let's switch now to more of the icon view and the activity. As indicated by all those little icons you saw in the original graph, the developers we observed switched activities a lot. On average, developers performed 47 different activities per hour with only 1.6 minutes on average spent per activity before switching to another. We analyzed the sequence of the activities performed using an n-gram approach to try and understand which activities they most frequently switched between. It probably won't surprise you to learn that testing often followed coding and coding often followed testing. Coding was also often superseded by an informal meeting either because someone asked them a question or the participant asked someone else a question. It's always important for us to remember that coding and software development is certainly not an isolated activity and requires all of the members of the team to work together. Emails were also most often checked while coding or testing. The two top activities in which developers spent time were coding. 32% of their time was spent coding and informal meetings which range from both instant messages to colleagues interrupting and asking a question to someone coming over and wanting over to their workspace to ask a question. In performing the activities, developers used almost 15 different programs. Several developers used multiple different programs to achieve a similar activity. If nothing else, this data shows that developers must be quick and they must be very flexible. Delving into the time spent per activities a little bit more, this graphic provides an overview of where the observed developers spent their time with respect to activities that are solely focused on software development itself in terms of creating software development artifacts. Coding and testing accounted for almost half of the developers' time. Other development activities really ended up being only a small fraction of the developers' work days, like, such as version control, at 2% or code reviews.
the other roughly half of the developer's time spent on activities with informal meetings being quite a non-trivial chunk of the amount of time that they were spending per day. Planning was also perhaps a little bit higher than any of us might have actually forecast. As you might remember from the survey results, developers cited that productive workdays can happen when they have few interruptions or distractions and they can really get into the flow where they're focused on what they're trying to achieve and are able to block out other things around them to really get into a problem at hand. Overall, in the observations, we were surprised by the sheer number of tasks and activities developers were performing. We were particularly surprised to find that 73% of the developers still felt, despite all those context switches and activity switches, that they were productive. We asked the developers how a context switch relates to the tasks and activity switches that we could actually observe directly. Pretty uniformly, the developers defined a context switch as when I have to stop thinking about one thing and start thinking about something else. So it's really related to what they cognitively have to have in their mind. Participants did explain that some context switches are small, such as getting distracted due to background noise or switching between programs when working on tasks. And some are large, such as switching between a main task and a code review or writing an email and switching between two cognitively different tasks. Although all participants agreed that context switches generally reduce their productivity, the cost or harm was stated to be dependent upon the duration of the switch, the reason for the switch, and the focus on the current. So in particular, the longer the switch, the more expensive. You can see from the quote on the screen, one participant said, stop and work on a different task is a more costly context switch than writing a quick email. Similarly, the more focused the developer is on a task, the more expensive the switch. Here's another quote from a participant. It depends on where I was. If it was a critical section, it's really hard to get back to focus on that task, even if it was for like only 30 seconds. An example of a less expensive switch is some that are self-inflicted, such as when you need to go on a coffee break or you're just writing a quick email unrelated to your current task. Because in those cases, your brain is not necessarily switching as much to have to load in as much cognitive new information. The distinctions in the kinds of context switches help explain what the developers felt was productive despite the high number of tasks and activities we observed. We saw how developers adapt to waiting times such as waiting for builds to complete by performing low-cost switches to tasks on which they can make progress. We also saw how participants switch to simple tasks, such as 30 seconds of code review, without apparent significant, significant impact to their primary task, which might be fixing a bug. So what can we take away from our observations on what developers do? Well, one thing we can do is to help developers avoid or prevent context switches since these switches hurt developers from being in the flow and being productive. The developers we studied mentioned several strategies. Close your email, shut off notifications, listen to music, close your office door if you have one, schedule a meeting with yourself to protect your time in the company, come in early or work from home. One team used an explicit indicator. Quoting from a participant, all devs in our team have a physical light on top of our monitors that reflects our sync status, so people walking by can see not, to disturb, see not to disturb us. This has been really useful in reducing random interruptions. All of these strategies, of course, have to be balanced, because even though they may increase an individual's productivity, the individual may be blocking others, leading to a loss of overall team progress. If we could do a better job of automatically recognizing context which is for developers, we could provide tools that could help visualize the information about the switches occurring and help developers retrospect on their work pattern. Such automatic recognition is pretty hard as it has to do not only with the program used and the task defined, but also the semantics of the work that's being performed. But if we could automatically determine context switches and assess their costs, 
imagine the kinds of devices we could provide that would allow people to try to balance both their individual and their team productivity. So now I've given you a bit of an idea of the kinds of surveys we've done, a little bit about what you learn when you observe developers. But all of these kinds of studies, surveys, and observations, they've got their limitations. The data I showed you was either retrospecting on what's going on or represented only a portion of a developer's day. To get a better view on how developers spend their day, we undertook a study where we installed a monitor onto their computer so we could get more longitudinal data about how software development actually occurs. This work was also joint with some of the same colleagues, and Laura Barton from UBC was also helpful in helping us analyze the data of the study. What we really cared about in this study to understand what do developers really do and when do they think they're productive. Our monitoring study included 20 participants, 19 of which were male and one which was female. In addition to collecting the actual programs on which they were working and how long they were working on them, we also collected samples of their own perceptions of their productivity and reports on tasks and activities that they performed through their workday. All of these participants were professional software developers with an average of 14 years of experience. The monitor we installed on their computer logs the currently active process and window title every 10 seconds. We also logged mouse clicks, movements, scrolling, and keystrokes. Every 60 to 90 minutes, a little survey would pop up on their screen asking them to compare their last session activity to their normal productivity level using a seven-point scale and to describe just in a few words the activities that they performed in the previous session. Over the course of the study, we collected data from 2,100 hours of participants' computer use over a total of 220 workdays, so lots and lots of data. We're still in the process of analyzing this data, so I'm just going to give you an overview of the kinds of information that we're finding from the data. One of the questions we were interested in answering was how developers spend their day to be able to compare to the much shorter observational data that we had. This chart shows the percentage of log time spent in those development activities. The arrows on the right-hand side provide a comparison to the observational data, whether it's the same, is increased or decreased compared to what we saw through observation. Our inability to find time spent in testing and in other activities is just an artifact of how we relate window titles and programs that were run, the kind of activities that we were being performed. As you can see, coding still accounts for a pretty substantial amount of the developer's day that we were looking at. If we look at the activities that are not correlated related to, to creating software development activities but are related in other ways, we can see there's a mixed comparison to the observational data. Email looked like it was taking up more time. Planning was a little less. Documentation was about the same, but a bit up. And you can see that we're unable in this way to capture informal. So in our observational data, we saw 13% of developers' time being spent on informal meetings. Here, of course, we're not going to gain as much insight through this kind of steady approach. By asking developers every 60 to 90 minutes how they were perceiving their productivity, we can analyze some patterns in when they seem to be productive through their own retrospection on their activities. So each of these charts represents just one participant, but we've gathered them into categories to show you what was really the trends in the overall reported productivity of our participants. So for each participant, we basically plotted their level of perceived productivity per time of day. And we found these three different categories. On the far left, we have a graph that represents essentially a morning person. This participant reported the highest level of productivity consistently over the period we monitored them in the morning. The middle chart represents someone whose productivity dips in the middle of the day. And the last chart represents an afternoon person. Overall, morning people were pretty rare in our sample, only 20% of our participants. 
Afternoon people represented 40% of the participants, but there may be many reasons why they were actually perceiving their productivity to be high in the afternoon. Perhaps they're industrious later in the day, or maybe with the majority of their workday behind them, perhaps they feel more productive as a result. These charts really reinforce that developers may have their own habitual patterns, and that if they were able to recognize these patterns, it might provide them help in guiding their own workday and in organizing how they actually perform their activities that they need to perform in a day. So this data is really just a glimpse into what we've analyzed so far in the data set. We're still completing our analysis. Some early takeaways are that development work might be even more highly fragmented than we thought. The monitored data suggests that developers spend only 0.3 to 2 minutes per activity. Our analysis of the data we collected does show the potential for individualized proxies that might help an individual developer reflect on their own productivity. For instance, number of mouse clicks or keystrokes per minute might help support a developer to get in and stay in a productive flow state, perhaps by automatically changing their availability in Skype or in other chat tools they might use. Alternatively, these proxies might help make a developer aware of when they're stuck and need to ask for help or take a break. There appears to be substantial opportunity to provide some individualized retrospective tools that are in the style of the quantitative self-movement. Maybe there's the equivalent of an Apple Watch activity tracker or a Nike fuel band for software development. In the shorter term, developers might reflect on when they perceive their productivity to be the highest and to consider their habitual patterns. Maybe if they block off time in their calendar during productive periods, they can increase their flow and their overall output of valuable work. Certainly seeing these results has made me think of doing the same thing for my own work pattern. So given this data and these observations, how might we improve the world of software development minute by minute? I certainly don't have all the answers, but I want to give you a few ideas about what we might be doing to improve the situation at the individual, the team, and the organizational level. I want to provide some ideas both in terms of professional practicing software developers today as well as what we might take on as challenges in the research community to try to provide even better approaches in the future. On the individual level, for professional software development today, our research really shows that there's some simple things, and I am using simple rather facetiously given how hard we know it is to change our own behavior some simple ways to improve our, our own productivity might include setting goals, the simple act of writing down what you're intending to do or tracking the work items on which you work can help focus what you are doing at the moment and can help you determine the progress you make towards the goal. The number one reason developers in our survey cited feeling productive is completing tasks or goals, but it's pretty hard to complete them if you don't know what you're actually doing. Another thing an individual might try is to organize their workday to minimize interruptions. Are you a morning person, a person who feels they're more productive in the afternoon? Maybe you could consider organizing your workday to enable uninterrupted work time in your productive period, even if it means closing your email or scheduling a meeting with yourself. We found developers feel more productive when they could get into a flow, so whatever you can do when you're Trying to solve a hard problem to get into that flow state will probably help. Achieving that flow state also requires managing distractions. What might you do in your work environment to minimize interruptions for those periods of time when you really need that in an uninterrupted work environment? On the research side, we just know so little about how developers actually work, and we provide them so few tools to retrospect on their activities. Our initial results show the need for individualization of measures, reports, and retrospection tools. We need ways to make sure that they feel that that data is their own and private, but provided in a way that they can really retrospect on it, maybe correlate it with various measures that are of interest to them, and work towards making themselves more productive. 
I mentioned earlier that focusing only on the individual can really harm the team. For instance, a number of the interruptions that occur in a developer's day tend to be colleagues asking for information. Causing each developer to work as an island would certainly not probably be a step forward. But professional software developers today can take steps to probably improve their productivity for their team. One way to do that is to use tool chains that can help better support context and flow. As one example, at TaskTop, we've developed a TaskTop dev product that enables a developer to better integrate development tools into their IDE. For instance, accessing issues from an enterprise tool, such as Microsoft TFS or HP ALM, directly in their IDE. When you do that, you can help to support fewer program switches, which might allow you to feel more in the flow, or at least cause you to do a lot less clicking and searching for the right program. Tools like Task.dev Dev has also been engineered to make multitasking easier and more intuitive, and to improve recovery time for interruptions. We can provide teams tools that enable this better context and flow support. The developer can focus on a task at hand and produce value for an organization in less time. In these cases, the benefits really are minute by minute. Survey and observations we conducted indicated very different views on meetings, often driven from which meetings were held and how they were conducted, meetings with specific agenda, the appropriate participants, and clear decisions were really viewed productively. Meetings that did not have such characteristics were not considered productive. Given that meetings often constitute a pretty significant portion of some development team's time, Ensuring that teams are really trained at effective meeting practices might yield significant benefits in your organization. On the research side, we've really only scratched the surface of what we might be able to do to enable better context and flow for developers working both alone and working together. There's so much that we could do to try to understand how we can integrate more information to be at a developer's fingertips when they need it, rather than to go and have to try to search for it. Even at the organizational level, productivity can really, I think, be attacked by removing friction and improving flow. A common theme that arose from our productivity studies was the need to determine information from others in the organization. Accessing this information caused interruptions both of individuals and of other people. And these represent the times an individual knows that they need information. Sometimes they're even unaware of information that might exist that could help them perform their task at hand. One way for organizations to improve their software development productivity minute by minute might be to streamline the communications between the many teams involved in a large software development project. Testop Sync product here is one example of an integration product that provides a means to provide real-time synchronization between the best of breed tools used by each part of a development organization. With TaskTop Sync, each member of a development team, a business analyst, a developer, a tester, and so on, can use the tool that's best for them, but still share the information from that tool with other members of their team. TaskTop Sync provides integration so that comments that a business analyst might add about a requirement that's been defined can be automatically transmitted to the developer's tool so they may act on that information without having to go through some complex long email chain. The intent of these kinds of integration tools is really to keep individuals focused on their own work and reduce interruptions, yet ensure everyone has the information and traceability that they need. How much of your development team's time might be gained back by not going through many, many emails to find the information that they need to carry on with their team? Another way I think organizations might be able to improve their overall productivity is to analyze the workflow that they're using. This really requires trying to understand end-to-end -end information about how development teams are working, where is parts of the development process lagging or getting stalled, where are people suffering because they don't have information they need. One example of a product that can help you in this area is TaskTop Data. Testop data allows you to collect data from all of the lifecycle management tools your organization might be using and start to answer questions that really span the entire software value chain. Which teams are producing the most severe defects in your organization might allow you to go in and try 
and understand uh, what's happening. And all our teams getting the project requirements they need on time might be able to help you actually get the information you need when you need it. So in summary, what would I really like you to take away from this talk? Here's kind of the talk in a nutshell. Improved productivity really starts with the individual. Improved productivity does not necessarily mean changing everything. By analyzing how software developers spend their time, we can suggest ways to improve software development productivity minute by minute. By gaining insights in developers' productivity, we learned about the need for individualized measurements of productivity and retrospection over those measurements. By gaining insight into how developers actually work by watching them, we learned about how there are habitual work patterns that might be improved through both simple mechanisms and that call for enhanced research. And hopefully I gave you some ideas of how you might improve software development productivity today and how researchers might improve it in the future, both at the team, individual, and organizational level. If you'd like more, any more information on the subject of this talk, you can find contact and reference information at the end of the slides that can be downloaded from the web webinar. It'd be great to hear from you. This work has been generously supported by NSERC and ABB, and has benefited from many interactions with research colleagues and colleagues at Task Talk. Thanks for joining me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Gail. That was, uh, that was, really, that was really fascinating. I think you know, we're all trying to figure out how we can be more productive, however we might define that. And, uh, and you've really helped us really understand as individuals, I think, understand how even small changes in, in organizing our work and uh, maybe flagging to others that we don't want to be interrupted uh, can really help us in our, in our ability to get stuff done. Uh, thank you. I think you've actually uh, you've given me personally a lot to chew on. Uh, and I'm going to take some of this and use it this afternoon. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, we have one uh, from another Gail, as it turns out. Um, and she asks, as a manager, I would be interested in similar research about how managers or project managers perceive developer productivity. Do you have any thoughts or plans along those lines? You know, that's a really great point. We've really been looking at it from the bottom up, and we probably haven't focused enough on sort of the top down, you know, sorry to call managers top down view of productivity, but I think it, it would be really fascinating to try and compare when the developers perceive themselves as being productive, whether from an organizational level, whether that's also being considered productive. So I think there's a lot of really great work that could be done in that direction. I'm not aware of any work right now that's being conducted, but, but maybe one of our other listeners might be able to inform us. It would be fascinating to know whether it, uh, individual practitioners in their management uh, feels the same way about productivity, wouldn't it? It would. It really would. Uh, we do have another uh, question um, from Radha. Uh, one more thing to consider is the type of development, application or user space versus system or device driver space. Having done both, I find that my testing or debugging time in system development is more compared to user space where I do more coding. I think that's a really great point. So we tried to, to look at some organizations that were developing different styles of software, but of course when you're only looking at a few organizations, you're going to get, especially with our observation and activity data, a kind of limited view on what is really occurring in different development spaces. And I think you're absolutely right. Depending on the kind of domain that software is being developed with, is really going to change some of the activities that are being performed. I think it's something that we're still struggling with in software engineering research overall, is to try and understand how to categorize the kinds of software that are being developed as we study the process and the artifacts. It might be that some closed source systems are being developed very similar to some open source systems. It might be that there's no comparison at all. But we don't do a very good job of trying to understand how to categorize what we're doing. In, in some ways, there's just so much to be done, we have to start somewhere. But I think it would be really fascinating to understand how the application area does affect how development is perceived. A great point. All right. And on a similar vein, we have another question, maybe uh, not about the type of 
of development, but the type of process being used. Uh, Alistair asks, were any of your research subjects participating in a scrum process? Yes, so actually um, in the activity and observation data that we have, where we more know where the, the participants are coming from, um, certainly at least one or two of the teams in each case was highly agile, and we're doing daily scrums and following a backlog and, and agile processes. And we also have a question uh, about uh, mostly how things were categorized, I'd say. So Andrew asks, uh, development, in quotes, doesn't show up in, in these categories. Is it split between coding and, and planning, perhaps? Uh, so yes. I mean, we, we certainly had to come up with a classification of the kind of activities that developers perform. And in some ways, you'd think that you could go out there and grab a list that, that everyone agrees on and work from there, but in fact there, there isn't a lot of agreement on exactly how to break down what people are working on. So what we might have categorized as planning, someone else might have categorized as they were just in their ethos. So we tried to do as um, careful a process as we could. We had two people watch at times and do some recoding of the information. And I should have mentioned in the observational studies, we did stop after the first 10 or 15 minutes of when we were coding what people did, and went back to them and asked them whether those codes were actually accurate so that we could make sure that we improved our own processes gathering the information. Well, Gail, you have so many questions to answer here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, De Dennis class in the uh, observation experiment, we didn't see any reading or learning activities. Were these activities not counted in the study? Uh, well, I think that's probably an artifact of two things. One is it can be an artifact of that four hours that we were watching. It could be that someone wasn't trying to learn a new API or learn a new part of a programming language. I think the reading activities, if, if the reference is to reading code, are going to be captured more in just the coding activity. We didn't split out program comprehension versus actively writing. Um, so I think you know, we didn't get down to that final level of granularity. And we would certainly have to observe, I think, for a much longer period of time to capture those times of the days that a developer might be on Stack Overflow or they might be on um, some other API documentation to try to understand and learn maybe a piece of software that they're about to use. These are great questions. They're, they're hitting at all of the, the places that, uh, that our studies have some issues. Yeah, I think a very popular topic you've hit upon, Gail. So Augustine asks, uh, did you ask questions related to perceived productivity from a developer related to, the de excuse me, related to the degree that he or she likes the task at hand? So for example, some developers are attracted to certain tasks, like designing coding new features, rather than in improving old code. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. We, we didn't. In the activity data that was collected, there is some information about emotional state for a few of the developers but um, quite a small part of our sample size. And it would be interesting to know if people have better perceptions when it is something that they would like to do versus not. Uh, Thomas Fritz at the University of Zurich and his students are doing some, some really cool studies that are also tracking biometrics while gathering computer monitored data, while gathering the, the kind of data about perceived productivity. So I think in, in the next year or two, you're going to see some really interesting data come out about how often developers seem frustrated versus not frustrated. Uh, there's so much that we could do and deliver to developers if we knew that they would be receptive, for instance, to recommendations. So trying to understand that emotional state is actually, I think, a really important part of making development better for developers on a day-to-day -day basis. Very interesting. Uh, so we have another question having to do with uh, kind of the kind of coding we're doing. So uh, the question is, programming today is increasingly about assembling functionality from the library. Was this trend picked up in your data? I think I absolutely agree with you. And it would come out only on the coding activities that we're seeing. I do think it's in, it probably depends on domain as well a little bit. It, it might be that if you're in device driver land that you're doing a little bit less of that than if you're really building more of a user-facing web application. Um, but I think uh, trying to understand 
how much of the coating was actually what we might perceive as raw from the ground code versus when it's assembly does affect the programming styles that people might have had some impact on. Right. And here's, here's a question. I'm not quite sure if, if this has to do with the Heisenberg principle or if we're trying to get at something else, but, uh, but the question is, don't you think monitoring developers on a personal level will put him under undue pressure? It may affect their innovative instincts as your comment, please. Maybe not the so, Heisenberg yeah. principle, but rather productivity in general. Well, I mean, there's, there's certainly always, always potential for some effect. I mean, when, when we found that eight of the 11 developers we observed were said they were productive, it could be just because they felt they should say that. And it's very difficult for, for us to assess that. I think one thing that's really interesting about having done these monitoring studies in multiple ways um, over a number of years is there's two effects. One is we never force someone to be monitored. So if they agree to be a participant, typically they're comfortable with the idea. The second thing that tends to happen is if it's an activity monitor on their computer, they tend to very quickly forget that, um, that they're actually being monitored. Um, even when I've seen studies being conducted um, that involve developers having various sensors on them, Again, you're kind of selecting for the people that are interested in that to begin with, but they very quickly forget that they're on, and, and we've seen them walk around the workplace still with you know sensors hanging off them at lunch because uh, it, it apparently doesn't really bother them. The other thing that we've seen is that developers get, when they get in the flow on trying to solve a task, they really forget that somebody's watching them or that they're being monitored because they tend to get extremely focused on the work that's being, being done. So I think there are effects, but I think they're a little bit less. If there's any concerns I have is that we're not actually reporting data on the average developer because they're the kind of developer that is willing to participate in the study. Right, they get extremely focused for a third to two minutes at a time. That's wow, right, that and then that. they switch that to something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness gracious. It's, it's, you know, sometimes when I hear these sorts of things, I wonder how on earth we develop software at all in the industry. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to actually have some, some concerted time to, uh, to get stuff done? It, it also concerns me that we select a certain kind of individual that can, can handle so much flux. Yeah, very interesting. So there was a, a question having to do with, um, with the type of programming language, uh, perhaps, that was used. So um, the, the question is, did your research detail what type of programming language the developers switched from? I mean, something like uh, C Sharp or, or, uh, or, or, or uh, SQL? No, we haven't really looked at all at um, the effects of language. Um, I think if you look in the academic literature, there's more and more studies that we're starting to see that try to analyze a little bit the effect of different programming languages on how people work, how much they're comprehending the code versus actually writing code. Um, but in general, people seem to, the people we've studied seem to be fairly comfortable with whatever language they're using. So I don't think we're seeing any learning moments that are happening. All right, terrific. Well, Gail, I am I'm afraid we've run out of time today. Um, sorry for the participants uh, for whom we haven't gotten a chance yet to uh, field your question. I'd like, you, I'd like to thank you so much, uh, Dean Murphy, for, uh, for your presentation and your insightful answers to all those questions. Uh, special thanks uh, to all of the attendees for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. Uh, this webinar, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was recorded and will be available online in a few days at the URL. Uh, on the screen. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org. So on behalf of SIGSOFT, uh, Gail Murphy and myself, that is that kind, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again in the future. And this concludes our webinar today.